Welcome to this weekly English news bulletin on Rona Hay. Peace and Democracy Party Group Deputy Chairwoman Parveen Buldan, who was among the delegation visiting the Kurdish leader Ojalan on 8th of February, conveyed the message of the Kurdish leader dedicated to the people of Rojava. In his message, the Kurdish leader emphasized the importance of the participation of all components of Rojava in the democratic self-rule administrations. Öncelikle Sayın Öcalan'ın e, son 8 Şubat tarihinde yapmış olduğumuz e, görüşmede e, çok sağlıklı ve moralli olduğunu e, iletmek istiyorum Rojava halkına. E, Sayın Öcalan e, hemen hemen bütün yaptığımız toplantılarda Rojava'ya ilişkin mutlaka bir değerlendirme yapıyor. E, bugün e, Rojava'da e, ilan edilen demokratik özelliğin ve e, oluşturulan kanton bölgelerin e, Sayın Öcalan için çok büyük bir anlamı ve önemi olduğunu ifade etmek istiyorum. Çünkü en son yapmış olduğumuz toplantıda Sayın Öcalan'a biz e, Rojava'da ilan edilen hem demokratik özelliği hem de oluşturulan kanton bölgelerle ilgili kısa bir bilgilendirme yaptık. E, PYD eş başkanı e, Asya Abdullah'ın Ankara'da bizimle yapmış olduğu görüşmeden sonra gittik e, adaya ve Sayın Öcalan'la görüşme yaptık. E, Sayın e, Asya Abdullah bize kanton bölgelerle ilgili bilgi vermişti. Biz de bu bilgiyi Sayın Öcalan'la paylaştık. Özellikle e, oluşturulan kanton yönet, e, yönetimlerinde e, diğer halklardan insanların da yönetime girmesinin çok önemli olduğunu ifade etti. E, dolayısıyla bundan sonra oluşacak olan yönetimlerde de mutlaka diğer halkların temsiliyetinin büyük bir önem e, arz ettiğini söyledi. Tabi sadece 3 bölgeyle sınırlı kalmamalı kantonlar. E, bu daha çok genişlemeli. Moreover, the Kurdish leader greeted the role of the Kurdish woman in the Rojava revolution. Ve 20 yılını Suriye'de geçirdiğini, Suriye'yi ve özellikle Rojava'yı çok iyi bildiğini, oradaki halkın ne kadar mücadeleye bağlı olduğunu, ne kadar değerli ve önemli olduğunu söyledi. Ee, ve bugünlere gelebilmek için Rojava halkının büyük emekler, büyük bedeller verdiğini söyledi. Ee, ve bu e, verilen emek ve bedelleri saygı, e, saygıyla selamladığını ifade etti. Çok büyük bir anlam ve önem verdiğini söyledi. Ee, daha çok mücadele etmek e, ve örgütlenmek e, bunun önemli olduğunu e, söyledi. Ve e, Rojava'da özellikle kadın devrimini selamladığını, kadınların bu süreçte önemli bir rol ve misyon üstlendiğini ve bunun Rojava'da açığa çıktığını The International Mother Language Day, formally recognized by the United Nations in 2008, is an observance held on 21st of February to promote awareness of the linguistic and cultural diversity and multilingualism. The International Mother Language Day represents the day in 1952 when students demonstrating for recognition of their language, the Bengali language, as one of the two national languages of the then Pakistan. More about this day in the next report. West Pakistan ordered Urdu as the official language, ignoring 56% of the population that spoke Bangla as their primary mother tongue. And there was an instant negative reaction among students responding with the slogan Rashtrabhasha, Bangla Chai, meaning we want Bangla as the state language. Sensing the simmering unrest of the Bengali people over their oppression, the government enacted Section 144, declaring all public demonstrations illegal. Students made the decision to break Section 144, knowing that it could cost them their lives. Students and women were demonstrating peacefully, yet they were shot and killed by the police without warning. Twelve students were killed. Over 96 received bullet injuries. The news of student killing spread rapidly all over the country and a full strike started at 3 p.m. that day. All offices, courts, shops, even radio and railway stations instantly shut down. People poured out on the streets. The whole country seethed with anger and outrage.
on the International Language Day where diversity is welcomed. Kurdish language does not enjoy equal status in Kurdistan. Kurdish people have been stripped of their mother tongue and forced to speak foreign languages as a method of assimilation. Today, Kurdish language is an official language in Iraq. The recognition of the Kurdish language in Iraq came after years of the Kurdish people's struggle in southern Kurdistan. In Turkey, on the other hand, the Turkish government placed severe restrictions on the use of the Kurdish language, prohibiting the language in education. The Kurdish alphabet is not recognized in Turkey. And the use of the Kurdish names containing the letters X, W and Q, which do not exist in the Turkish alphabet, is not allowed. In Iran, where more than a quarter of the Kurdish population live, the authorities conduct a harsh policy of assimilation. All Kurdish publications and teaching of the language are forbidden. According to the Iranian constitution, language and script of the official and common people of Iran are the Pharisee. Acts, correspondence, official texts and textbooks should be written in that language. While according to Article 4 of the Syrian constitution, Arabic is the official language. Under this single provision, the classical Arabic language is the vehicle of all communications of the Syrian state. In other words, the constitution of the Syrian Arab Republic, adopted on 12th of March 1973, prohibited the Kurdish language. Since the start of the Rojava Syrian Revolution in March 2011, the people of Rojava made use of the vacuum left by the Syrian regime and started to organize themselves in all areas, including education. In this regard, the Teachers' Union and the Kurdish Language Association were established, aimed at reviving the Kurdish language in Rojava. After major efforts made by the Kurdish people and their organizations, the Kurdish language started to be taught at all the schools. We teach the Kurdish language here, which was banned under the regime. We've lost many things, but these lessons allow us to hold on to our language, our traditions and our culture. We think our revolution starts with our language, because our language is our identity. That's why we're doing this, to show that we're still here and we're still resisting. Despite the assimilation policies imposed on Kurds in four parts of Kurdistan, Kurds preserve their language, culture and identity. On this year's International Language Day, Kurds took to the streets and continued their struggle to obtain their basic right of speaking and getting education in their mother language. Kurdish is the language of more than 40 million Kurds living in a fast and broken territory. Kurdish belongs to the family of the Indo-European languages and to the Iranian-Aryan group of this family. Due to the continuous resistance of the Kurdish people against decays of repression and assimilation policies, the Kurdish language has not been extinct. To promote awareness of the Kurdish language, tens of thousands of Kurds across Kurdistan hold each year demonstrations to mark UNESCO's International Language Day. On the occasion of the 15th anniversary of UNESCO's International Language Day, the institution of the Kurdish language organized across Rojava demonstrations in which mainly the youth took part. <laughs>
While in northern Kurdistan, the Organization to Preserve Kurdish Language organized a week-long events and activities under the slogan, Political Struggle is the Struggle to Protect the Language, History and Land. The announcement of the self-rule administration by the people of Rojava has been debated in the Swedish parliament. The debate followed the release of the Swedish government's 2014 foreign policy declaration. During the discussions in the Swedish parliament, Bodo Sieplus, the foreign policy spokesperson of environmental party the Greens, referred to the proclamation of the democratic self-rule administrations of Rojava by saying that it could cut the Gordian knot in Syria. Sipolis added, this is not only a question of territorial integrity of state's borders, but at the same time, a solution to the Syrian problem. The formation of a federal state could cut the Gordian knot in Syria. On her part, Amina Kakabav, the Kurdish-Swedish MP from the left party from Eastern Kurdistan, said that women of Kurdistan and Syria should be included in any peace process in order to build an enduring peace in the Middle East, and that a responsibility fell to Sweden to help in this process. Amina Kakabav also drew attention to violations of human rights on both Iran and Turkey. Kakabav said that Iran is trying to establish a dialogue with the West at the same time that it uses oppression, torture and executions against its own opposition. Christian Democratic Party MP Robert Halaf spoke on his part on how there was no Kurdish or Assyrian representation at Geneva too, and said that if a lasting peace is to be built, a new conference should take place in which these peoples would be represented. Among other issues that came up on the agenda was the lack of press freedoms in Turkey. Desiree Betrus, an MP from the Christian Democratic Party, a government partner, reminded her colleagues that 70 journalists remained imprisoned in Turkey. Moreover, in an interview with Fred News Agency, the Kurdish Swedish Parliament member Amina Kakabav slammed the foreign policies of the Swedish and Western countries with Iran and Turkey. Moreover, the Swedish MP stated that she would make a written application to the Turkish Interior and Justice Ministry to visit the Kurdish leader Ocalan. The Swedish Left Party Parliament member Amina Kakubav said that Sweden and other Western countries based their relations with Turkey and Iran on economic interests and not on human rights. Adding that peace process in Turkey had come to a halt because of its being conducted unilaterally. Kakubav said the talks should be carried out in a transparent fashion under the auspices of a country or institution in order for the process to be revived. Kakabav compared Imrali Island to Guantanamo and said that she would make a written application to the Turkish Interior and Justice Ministry to visit the Kurdish leader Ocalan. Prior to Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bill's visit to Iran on 3rd of February, the Iranian ambassador in Stockholm wrote to Kakabav, who was born in eastern Kurdistan, asking to meet her. But Kakabav rejected the request. Kakabav stated in this regard, I refused to meet the Iranian ambassador in order not to give the impression things were changing. Despite the passage of the case, Sharia law was still in force in Iran. Human rights activists, intellectuals, workers and Kurds are subjected to repression, torture, imprisonment and execution. Since the announcement of the democratic self-rule administrations of the three cantons of Rojava, in which all components are taking part, the Rojava politicians are promoting the emerged democratic model to the region, to the regional and western countries. In this regard, Sina Mohammed, the co-chair of People's Council of West Kurdistan, visited Norway and held series of meetings with Norwegian politicians and with the Kurdish community. To shed more light on Sina Mohammed's visit to Norway, the political activist Rawan Hajo will join us now live from Norway. Welcome, Rowan, to our show. Um, tell us more uh, about Sina Mohammed's visit to Norway and the size uh, she met. Uh, well, ever, ever since the establishment of the three autonomous captains was declared, uh, there has been a diplomatic effort 
on part of leading Kurdish politicians uh, to gain international recognition and support uh, to establish relations, uh, but also to discuss the latest developments on the ground, uh, especially the war taking place between the YPG on the one hand and radical al-Qaeda groups on the other. Uh, in this context, uh, Sina Mohammed, uh, co-chair of the People's Council in Western Kurdistan, uh, recently made a trip to Norway, uh, where she met with representatives from uh, the major political party in Norway, uh, which of course is the Labour Party. Uh, more specifically, she met with the Norwegian MP uh, Johan Dörren uh, and the Labour Party's international secretary, uh, Mari Vest. Uh, Mrs. Hanad also met with local Kurdish communities in Norway, um, in two cities, in Oslo, the capital, and the city of Stavanger. Uh, in these cities, she held a number of seminars, uh, gave talks. Uh, she also met with uh, a number of journalists, giving interviews and updating about the latest developments. Mm -hmm. The establishment of the Democratic Self-Rule Administration, Sofro Jada, were on the top of the discussions. What has been said exactly in this regard and what were the Norwegian politicians' reactions to uh, the administrations? Well, obviously the declaration of the three cantons was uh, the major topic uh, during these meetings. Mm -hmm. But it's important to bear in mind that uh, there was an outcry and express of fear coming from uh, parts of the Syrian opposition uh, that the Kurds were on their way to separation. Uh, so this step was seen as a threat uh, by some parts of the opposition. Uh, so a major part of uh, Mrs. Mohammed's talk was to downplay these fears and to in fact show that uh, despite the declaration of the autonomous cantons, the Kurdish areas form uh, a part of the Syrian territory and will form a part of the Syrian territory in the future. Uh, however, Mrs. Mohammed explained that Firstly, uh, the new administration uh, is in fact transitional, it's not permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, that it has been established in order to tackle urgent needs and demands of the people. As you sure know, uh, since the civil war in Syria broke out, there has been a major administrational vacuum in the Kurdish areas. Uh, and this new, uh, newly established administration has been um, put in place to fill that vacuum. Uh, and moreover, Mrs. Hamid explained that the new administration represents all segments of the Syrian society mm -hmm. and that the rights of all peoples are guaranteed. In fact, they are enshrined in the new, con in the new constitution, which was recently published. Um, with regards to uh, the reception uh, uh, to uh, Sina Mohammed's uh, meet, uh, meeting, it was met with a lot of interest and enthusiasm by the Norwegian representatives and they were uh, actually positively surprised by the political prosperity that has that been taking place in the Kurdish areas uh, during a time where the country is being torn to shreds by the war. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Mohammed also pointed out that the Kurds are fighting uh, the so-called pronounced enemy of the West which of course is uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, and she uh, pointed out that their efforts should be recognized in this regard. Um, and finally, there was also talk of sending an Norwegian delegation uh, to uh, the three autonomous cantons, uh, consisting of members of parliament and the Norwegian media, mm -hmm. so that they could see the latest developments uh, for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kurdish initiative Zagros platform is organizing today a seminar uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, who are the speakers uh, at the seminar and what will be discussed, uh, Rowand? Uh, well, it's true. Uh, the seminar is actually taking place as we speak, um, uh, and the major the major topic of of uh, the seminar will, of course, be uh, the the declaration of the new uh, autonomous regions. Uh, but it's also more generally about the war in Syria, um, and the speakers. Uh, it is uh, some uh, part of the Swedish media, some journalists, some politicians, uh, but it's also attended by. Um, the co-chair of the Dem Democratic Union Party, Salah Muslim. Mm -hmm. Let's move on uh, to the Norwegian media coverage on Rojava. Tell us more about how the Norwegian media outlets uh, cover the developments going on in Rojava and in particular the announcement of the administrations. Uh, well, as I said, uh, uh, Mrs. Sina Mohammed met with a number of journalists in, uh, in Norway. But as of now, there has uh, uh, not been any publications. But um, as far as we know, there should be uh, uh, there should be some media covered uh, in, in the coming days. Mm -hmm. uh, Rowan Hajo, political activist, you've been with us from Norway. Thank you very much for the update. Definitely.
following an official visit of representatives of Jazir Kanta's administration to the Iraqi capital of Baghdad, an agreement has been reached between the sides to open the border crossing, which has been liberated by People Defense Units on October 23, 2013. The border post at Tulkocher between Rojava and Iraq has been officially opened following talks with the Iraqi government. The spokesperson of the Jazir Canton administration, Juan Mohammed, announced that an agreement had been reached with the Iraqi government. According to this agreement, the Iraqi government will open its western border with the Rojava town of Tulkocher, but the priority will be given to the movement of daily necessities. The agreement came following a visit by representatives of the Canton administration to federal Kurdistan on 12th of February and from there to Baghdad. The Turkocher border crossing, the most strategic held by Kurds to date, was seized by the People Defense Unit Siepage from the Islamic State of Iraq and Bashan and other armed groups on 23rd of October 2013 after a week of fierce clashes. The People Defense Units liberated the Tulkocher city and its border crossing from the armed groups with the help of a local Arab tribe called the Shammar tribe. The Islamic State of Iraq and Tashan had used the border crossing, which is near Mosul, as a major base for attacks on Rojava and for the passage of fighters and weaponry. The opening of Tulkocher border crossing came at a time the three cantons of Rojava, Jazir, Kobani and Afrin are under Titan siege for months. Opening the border crossing with Iraq will alleviate the sufferings of the people of Rojava and will form an alternative to Turkey, northern and southern Kurdistan border crossings. Yeni Uzgur Politika newspaper unveiled in a report that mainly underage Kurdish women in refugee camps in southern Kurdistan are being sold to rich locals and foreigners. According to the report, the Kurdish women are being sold through human traffickers. The Kurdistan Regional Government's Department of Immigration and Immigrants said that since the outbreak of the Syrian conflict, the Kurdistan region has received nearly 157,000 refugees, of whom 14,000 were sheltered in Suleymaniye, 40,000 in Erbil, and more than 100,000 in Duhok. While life is difficult for all refugees escaping the ongoing violence in Syria and hard living conditions in Rojava, for women it can be particularly harsh. Women who are separated from their communities and families often face a high risk of exploitation ranging from human trafficking to underage marriages as well as violence and abuse. A report published in Yeni Uzgur Politika newspaper unveiled that female Kurdish refugees in southern Kurdistan camps are being sold to rich locals and foreigners. According to the report, the Kurdish women in southern Kurdistan refugee camps are facing a tragic fate and are being sold through human traffickers to men from mainly Mosul, Baghdad, Dubai and Qatar. Women as young as 13 and 14 are being sold and women under the age of 18 are said to fetch higher prices. The women are being sold at rates of between 10 and 40 thousand dollars. According to the testimonies gained by Yeni Uzgur Politika, interested men are brought to the camps by officials of some Rojava political parties. The human traffickers show the interested men photographs of women from the camp. No price is listed, but when the client likes a woman, the family and the girl are called and negotiations take place at an office in the camp. When an agreement is reached and money is handed over, an imam arrives and performs a marriage ceremony. The officials at the camp then provide the buyer with the necessary documents to get the woman out of Iraq if necessary. According to the testimonies gained by Yeni Uzgur Politika newspaper, the received money is shared between the human trafficker, the officials at the refugee camp and the family of the woman.
to discuss Southern Kurdistan policies towards Rojava, the analyst on Kurdish affairs, Jan Ezid Khalo, will join us now live from Southern Kurdistan, the city of Slemanye. Thanks for being with us, uh, Mr. Ezid Khalo. Uh, let me start uh, asking you about your view on the self-rule administrations of Rojava. Uh, what's your assessment on this achievement gained by the people of Rojava? Yes, um, hello, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, the self-rule uh, administration in Eastern Kurdistan of Rojava came as a natural result after establishing committees in villages, towns, and cities, mm -hmm. this which have uh, been under the control of People's Protection Units, YPG. It's not a gift offered by anyone, but the result of the comeback of hundreds of thousands of brave Kurdish young girls and boys this, uh, these regions are the only diverted zones in Syria, and this is because of the reality that all sects, communities, and religions are free how to practice their beliefs, and they are welcomed along with their differences. Obviously, this is not possible in any other regions of all over Syria. On the other hand, uh, it is the first time in the Middle East that we have an interim constitution which begins with we, the people of areas of self-administration, Kurds, Assyrians, Turkmens, Armenians, Chechens, etc. Nonetheless, we should know that this administration has to make good relations to invite international organizations to see this reality from inside. Mm -hmm. All the major parties in southern Kurdistan, apart from the KDP, uh, recognize the administration set up in Rojava. Uh, is the KDP decision of not recognizing the administrations a pure Kurdish decision, or are there any uh, powers who are exerting pressure on the KDP to take this stance? Now, well, the, the situation uh, in south Kurdistan or KRG is evident. We are waiting for new. Uh, government since five months, we have the problem of budget, we have a financial crisis uh, which is not solved yet, an agreement on petroleum of Kurdistan was signed between KDP and Turkey in the name of KRG government. Mm -hmm. KDP became the party in the agreement and it caused more complicated situation. There is also uh, uh, an infight going on between uh, Gulen and Erdogan, as you know, in Turkey, but both of them have their own institution in southern Kurdistan. When we talk, when we take all these into account, we can easily conclude that the decision of, of not recognizing a Kurdish administration by another Kurdish administration cannot be a pure Kurdish decision. In addition, uh, the ones who uh, verbally support and recognize the self for administration of Rojava mm -hmm. have not showed a, de a demonstration yet. So this may be a part of the political problem inside KRG. The other two main actors in the Middle East, USA and Russia, should not be forgotten as well. Mm -hmm. Their decisions are also important for KRG, so I can say this is the result of the two strategies of two main powers in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, in general, to what extent can we say that the political decision in southern Kurdistan is independent nowadays? Now, the political decision cannot be independent in this situation, especially, as I mentioned before, when we talk about the two main strategies in the Middle East and so in southern Kurdistan, if we mention a, a political decision, we may give the example of the Kurdish regions which are still under the control of Baghdad and the urbanization policy or politics which is still going on in many Kurdish districts there. Uh, now, we can ask, could these parties do anything for their people there? Now, PUK leaders signed two uh, agreements to save the unity of their party in Tehran, mm -hmm. and the KDP leaders declare that they will not recognize the self-rule administration of Rojava from Istanbul. This is clear whether the decision is independent or not. At the same time, the Syrian Kurdish National Council couldn't issue a communique about the self-rule in Rojava only after the meeting with Mr. Barzani in Hawler. So I think Kurds first should unite, support, and respect the decisions of each other Mm -hmm. then we can talk about an independent
political decision. Let's move on to Turkey. Uh, Turkey is definitely not happy with uh, another Kurdish region on its border. Uh, what could we expect from Turkey in the future as a response to these administrations? Turkey cannot be happy with any Kurdish administration. Mm -hmm. There are a number of manners about this issue. The Kurdish uh, state have always tried, or the Turkish, uh, sorry, Turkish state have always tried to control the situation and decrease the influence on Kurds, on Kurds in northern Kurdistan and Turkey. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that KRG has a border of 10 kilometers with Turkey and cannot decide without Turkey, they still have an influence on Kurds and there. Now we have a region with a border of hundreds kilometers with Turkey. Mm -hmm. These cantons have mutual extension with North Kurdistan, North Kurdistan cities like Mardin, Ruha, Orfa, Antep, and Hatay. Turkey knows that Rojava cantons will influence these cities and all Kurds inside Turkey. Here I especially want in, in Passis, African region, where I am coming from, most of our relatives in Antep and Hatay provinces identify themselves as Turks. And this is the result of assimilation politics of Turkey. But this will not last long under the new circumstances. The relations and establishing ties will eliminate the past policies. Mm -hmm. Turkey realizes this, and it, it will try to decrease this influence with the new policies which will affect Kurds mm -hmm. on both sides. Kurds and Rojava are lobbying abroad in order to gain regional and international recognition. Till now, nothing has been achieved in this regard. Could there be a shift in these stances? Well, of course, uh, there will be a shift. Uh, the situation of Syria is very complex. There is an international conflict about Syria, but the situation in Rojava is somehow different. Kurds should do more to explain the reality of the new administration in Rojava. Mm -hmm. They should find ways to influence the world public opinion and draw the attention to the reality of what is going on in Rojava. For example, those who represent the administration should be talented diplomats, educated people, and should know many languages, especially English. Mm -hmm. So they have to know how to deal with the world new policy in Syria and how to use the balance between the main two strategies approach to explain how the largest ethnic minority that has long been discriminated against by the regime and now by the jihadists and racists. Mm -hmm. At the end, um, the Kurdish leader is focusing during his visits uh, to the importance of holding the Kurdish National Congress. Uh, to your opinion, what will, be, um, a, what will the Kurdish National Congress mean for the Kurdish issue in four parts of Kurdistan? Now, I was one of the participators in the preparation of the Kurdish National Congress in Hawla. Mm -hmm. So I can say holding Kurdish Congress will affect the Kurdish policy in Kurdistan, in all Kurdistan, especially in Rojava. The Congress will be the first step toward protecting Kurdish people in Rojava from jihadists and the extremists. Mm -hmm. After about a century, Kurds in the Middle East have another chance to live free on their own land. We know about the 1920s world policy against Kurds and the Kurdish mistakes. Now we have another chance and I think the situation is more ready for the Kurds to gain their rights and this will be possible only by uniting their efforts. Mm -hmm. Also I can say the main problem in the talks about the Kurdish National Congress was the situation of Rojava because everyone knows that this small region or small regions in Rojava are the key of all the problems in Syria and also in all Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. Therefore, many countries, and especially Turkey, has its own influence on the holding this Congress. The agreement about Rojava in the preparation for the Congress will shape the Kurdish policy in all Kurdistan. Jen Ezid Khallo, analyst on Kurdish affairs. You've been with us from southern Kurdistan. Thank you very much for speaking to Ronahi. Let's move on now to the Rojava news in brief.
40 Islamic religious leaders from Jizir Canton have given their support to the Kurdish leaders' Ojalan proposal to hold a democratic Islamic conference. The leaders also condemn the attacks and atrocities being carried out in Syria in the name of the Islam. Moreover, the leaders held elections and established a committee consisting of 20 members under the auspices of the Jazeera Canton's Commission of Religious Affairs. The relief committees in Kobani Canton of Rojava are continuing providing aid and assistance to the internally displaced people who fled the violence in different parts of Syria and headed to the stable Rojava. Kobani and Afrin cantons of Rojava, which are under continuous siege imposed by some armed groups, are hosting a huge number of refugees. The Kurdish Red Crescent provided the hospitals of Hasaki city of Rojava with narcotic drugs. According to the Kurdish Red Crescent, the distributed narcotic drugs is enough to conduct 500 surgeries. The Kurdish Red Crescent was founded in 1993 in the city of Bochum in Germany. Since the start of the Syrian Rojava revolution in 2011, the Kurdish Red Crescent started to provide relief aid to the people in need. The institution of the Kurdish language has distributed in Jenderis town of Afrin city 26 certificates to students who completed the first level in the Kurdish language after a course of three months. At the end of this bulletin, let's move on to the press review. Die Deutsche Welle has published an article entitled with Women Join the Kurdish Fight in Syria. Syrian Kurds are fighting for an autonomous region in the northeast of the country. They have largely managed to drive out Assad's troops. Now they are fighting the Islamists, a third of the fighters are women. The Kurdish party PYD has also introduced a woman's quota of 40% and the party's executive is half woman. Co-chairwoman to Asya Abdullah is fully dedicated to her political work and equality. Israel's oldest daily newspaper Haaretz said in an article, Syria's girls follow their brothers in bid for autonomy. Haaretz conveyed what a young girl holding a Kleshnikov told a foreign reporter who was making a documentary on the Kurdish struggle in Syria. This is our country and we will fight for it. Michael Robin wrote for the Commentary magazine about the Syrian conflict and said, Last month I spent several days in Syria's northeastern Hasaka province, home to Syria's Kurdish minority, thousands of Syria Christians and many Arabs as well. It seems remarkable that with the disaster that is Syria today, the White House would not jump at a chance to support a stable, secular and secure region that is relative pro-American. Michael Robin has also written on this subject for the American Wall Street Journal and said, The U.S. gets the Kurds wrong again. In Iraq we ignored them until we discovered that they were our best allies. Now those in Syria are being neglected. Orhan Kamal Cengiz has written for our monitor about relations between Kurds and Armenians in Turkey and said, Ojalan extends hand to Armenians. Orhan went on saying, Something unexpected happened on January 13th. Ojalan sent a letter to the Turkish-Armenian language newspaper Agos. This seemed to represent a turning point for Kurdish-Armenian's relations. Comments by Armenian intellectuals on Ojalan's letter indicated that Turkish-Armenian community was pleased by the letter. For example, Ohanis Kelejdar said Ojalan adopted a position way above the norms of Turkish politics when it comes to coming to terms with the Armenian genocide. Karin Karaksli said Ojalan's call on the Turkish Republic to come to terms with the history and his warning to all people against traps of nationalism are vital. According to the human rights lawyer Orhan Cengiz, in any case, Ojalan's letter to Armenians is a historical document now. That's all for this week. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.